Very good evening. Welcome, welcome to Crime Vlog Weekly. My name is Hartley. How are you doing? Okay, we're based over here in London, UK. We've been following the Karen Reed uh, murder trial. And we are coming to a final end. It's been declared a mistrial. Yes, we have got some clips for you from the um, live court earlier today. Um, as you know, we're based over here in London, central London. Um, we've, we've been following this case actually from, from day one, right up to this present moment, keep, keeping you updated. Um, most people seem to be uh, disgusted at what the police did in this particular case. Well, the evidence that came out from the um, police detectives and how they handled this case, um, it divided many people and has caused a lot of problems within this uh, particular case. Before we get going, please um, hit the subscribe button, also the like button. I'd like to say a big shout out to um, those of you over there in North America, um, especially in Boston where this is all happening, the town of Canton. And those of you down there, Australia, Caribbean, South America, and up there on the African continent. Thank you very much. And again, please hit that like button, help us to um, spread all across the YouTube network. After the jury has been sent out um, two times by the judge, um, again the jury came back in and the judge had to declare it a mistrial. I'm going to give you a clip of um, the actual find, last uh, finding by the judge here and the questions from the jury. Okay, here's a video clip of the judge um, when they came back to, when she actually came back to give the um, decision on the... Judge Canoni, despite our rigorous efforts, we continue to find ourselves at an impasse. Our perspectives on the evidence are starkly divided. Some members of the jury firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof, establishing the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Conversely, others find the evidence fails to meet this standard and does not sufficiently establish the necessary elements of the charges. The deep division is not due to a lack of effort or diligence, but rather a sincere adherence to our individual principles and moral convictions. To continue to deliberate would be futile and only serve to force us to compromise these deeply held beliefs. I'm not going to do that to you folks. Your service is complete. I'm declaring a mistrial in this case. I'll be in to see you privately in a few minutes. So thank you so much for your service. Well, that was the um, decision earlier today in the court over there in Canton, Massachusetts. A mistrial. In actual fact, um, it was said earlier that um, the jury is being held hostage there was a lot of comments across the internet, across the social media, that um, the judge is forcing the, um, the jurors to come to a decision, more likely to be a guilty verdict. Um, uh, many people, especially Karen Reed supporters, was not happy that she's forcing the jurors to go back into the jury room and come to a positive um, decision. Um, it's felt that had it been, had, had they continued to keep sending the jurors in, and obviously they want to get home, 4th of July is coming up, and they want to get home, um, and they're not coming together. Um, if they had to make a, a quick decision, they possibly would have um, gone and said um, guilty, which would not be fair. So. Um, um, luckily, um, they all came to decision and st stuck to their guns. We're not sure the split. We're not sure if it's six to six, or two to eight, or two two to f um, two to ten. We're not sure what the split is of the um, the juries, but we will find out it eventually. Um, it's been a long case. It's been going on for about two years. 
There was a lot of um, pre-trials, lots of evidence was uh, kept away from the jury. We've, we, as the viewers who've been um, following this case, uh, knew much more than what the jurors was uh, told or allowed to see. So um, this is all part of where, why, why this is um, a mistrial. And I'm sure when the next trial comes up, if it does come up, uh, most of this evidence will fully come out again because lots and lots has been said within this within this particular trial we have found out exactly what the police was doing what they were saying what evidence they put in that um was not true so um second time around she will definitely be found not guilty we're not sure if the um prosecution will put it through because they've got lots and lots of answers to give especially definitely on the police side um even the evidence from the dog the dog um evidence of all the scratches on his uh, right arm they um the judge did not want too much of the um expert expert the, the dog expert to um give too much uh of her knowledge in this particular case so as i said lots and lots of um evidence was kept away from the juries they were totally confused um, they did take some things into consideration such as the timeline the timeline from the prosecution did not match eventually they uh, tried to match the timeline to what the witnesses was actually saying but that obviously that was too late but obviously that confused the jurors um, this is from my point of view don't forget, I'm a citizen, <laughs> citizen Hartley, all the way over here in London, UK, and been watching this trial. I have no um, no knowledge of the law. Of um, in actual fact, I've learned quite a lot since I've been um, watching this trial and some other trials over there in the US. So I'm le I'm learning the US law. Um, some of it is good. Some it's not good, like all countries, but. Um, this one, this one, because lots of evidence was kept away from the jury, um, they were totally, totally confused. Um, I think more should have been done with um, giving the evidence about the home, the homeowners and the police family. Um, Lots of that evidence was kept away from the jury. And the, as I said, the police, all the different police um, hiding evidence and not telling the truth or uh, collusion together to give untruths. I, put, I have to put it that way. But um, this is all part of why this um, mistrial happened. There was some. Um, clearly lack of um, evidence to prove that Karen Reed did um, reverse her car at sort of 22 miles per hour and hit her boyfriend John O'Keefe, um, who was the policeman of course, and backed into him and uh, caused his injuries which um, eventually left him on the front lawn of another policeman's officers, uh, police officer's um, home and drove away. Um, there was definitely lack of evidence to prove that. Um, she did have a crack, um, a crack uh, light at the back of her car and apparently um, one uh, officer did give that evidence to say, well, yes, when he first came to see the car, it um, only had a crack, but somehow once the vehicle was seized and taken to the um, police station, or shall I say, yes, the Canton police station, um, for some reason, somehow, the whole of the back uh, light was cracked. Well, not cracked, it was smashed. Looks as though um, someone totally smashed it with um, an object. And 
it's believed that possibly the chief the chief investigating officer or should we say chief investigating case officer it looks like he had something to do with that and was collusion with uh, two or three other officers um in that um garage where her cat car was kept also the other thing they did not get a warrant for seizing her car <clears throat> also the police um uh they actually gave the wrong time when they collected the car they said the car was collected around the time of um uh i think they said 5 30 p.m which was incorrect the car was actually seized at 4 15 p.m um the the truck drivers um did not um seem as though the truck driver this is probably evidence that's also being held back because the truck driver should have um taken photographs of the vehicle while it was being seized most times i would say more 99 percent of the time if a truck driver was taking a vehicle on board his truck he would um take photos all around of that vehicle so that he doesn't get blamed himself for um damage to the vehicle normally is at least 10 to 12 photos taken by a truck driver the back the front sides um <clears throat> wheels everything make sure there's no scratches and no photos was produced in the court by the um prosecution this leaves um doubts very very much lots of doubts in this particular case so no wonder that they did come back on this trial as i said lots and lots of evidence was kept away from the jury so um, there's so many different parts that did not did not match also um the, the it was told by the um the prosecution told the defense they did they did not know where the family dog was being held that came out in the case that um, it was being held in a different state they they actually gave away their dog to a home this is shortly after after this case um started um so that that was a problem because the defense wanted to be able to uh, have the dog tested for dna and this this particular evidence about the dog was kept away bearing in mind there was um scratches on the right hand side of um the the dead police officer john o'keefe um it clearly clearly looked to me i'm not an expert but um it clearly looked to me like it was scratches dog scratches not something that happened from a car accident also there were about three medical um doctors that said the injuries that they um, looked at did not look like it came from a car accident especially at that sort of mileage that it was said so um that was another bit of evidence that uh, also confused confused the jury obviously some of them did believe that she was guilty um, as i said the prosecution did put together their theory of what happened as i said um, the police department from the canton office um, had a lot to do with this with colluding with the chief the chief um, case officer and this is michael proctor you're going to hear a lot more about him as we go on even though the case is finished it's going to continue because there is um there's an fbi um uh investigation within uh within that boston area um investigating this officer um michael proctor you heard him give evidence in one of my earlier videos but he's definitely under um investigation for the handling of this particular case so um that itself can also lead to um karen reed being exonerated totally from this um, particular case we're not sure what the fbi is going to say after this but um, um 
we do need to hear the full evidence from that particular case of um, why they totally dis, um, they totally um, give evidence. They actually throw evidence into the case. They give evidence to um, the prosecution and the defense that um, they, they, they felt themselves that this trial should not be going ahead because of um, the investigation they were doing into this Michael Proctor. As I said, Michael Proctor is the chief case officer of this case. And he, for some reason, did not like Karen Reed. And within 16 hours of investigating the case, he made up his mind that she was guilty. So um, add that to the mix and it's not, it's not good. We also have to bear in mind that um, on that particular night, 29th of, um, 29th of January, 2022, it seemed as though everyone was drinking. They were drinking at the different bars before they went to the after party. As we do know that um, Karen Reed did not attend the after party. She was at the bars drinking before in, and we can say, yes, she was drinking under the influence because she did have quite a few drinks uh, before she um, decided to drop her boyfriend to this after party, which she did not att attend. And it seems, according to the timeline, it seems as though Karen Reed was uh, back um, back at her the home by, uh, I think it was 12.36 a.m. in the morning. And it seems as though um, she dropped her boyfriend off around 12, 1230 and two witnesses did say they seen they saw Karen's car outside but <clears throat> sorry what they also saying is that um, her boyfriend did not enter yet still um, between the hours of uh, 1215 and 12 um, 1215 and sort of 130 in the morning or so I said to 1 45 a.m in the morning <clears throat> there were people in coming and going from that particular home which is the uh, police officer's home that's brian albert excuse me <clears throat> so um no one saw a body lying on the front lawn it was it was snowing not very much slight dusting dusting snow was falling between the hours of 12.30 and um, sort of 5.30 in the morning. It's only after that it came down very, very, very heavy. Um, but um, they were coming and going from that particular property in the early morning. And it was said by witnesses that um, no one saw a body, a six foot two gentleman lying on the lawn. That's another confusing issue on this particular case. Um, um, I'm sure the jury was totally confused. They, they um, were not able to come to a definite guilty or not guilty. Um, the, as I said, the defense um, insisted that something happened in the house <laughs> The theory, the theory, the theory from the um, defense is that they had a fight inside. The, jo the dog joined in, and they colluded inside. They took, they took John John O'Keefe's body down into, or they took John O'Keefe um, down into the basement. Um, something happened down there. Possibly fighting. He possibly his head probably fell back and hit. An instrument of some sort downstairs and they uh, took his body out through the back door and moved uh, it seems as though the homeowner then moved his Ford Edge car at the front of the house so that um, no no neighbors um, ring video will be able to pick up what's going what's going on or what happened and they um, we're saying they, we're not sure, sure who, but there was at least three, four, three or four strong men in that house. But the theory is that the, um, from the defense is that they brought the body and laid it on the front, right at the front. Uh, 
so they'd be able to blame someone else. Um, they also knew that the um, snowplow driver would be coming down sometime later on in that morning. Uh, possibly, possibly, we don't know. This is um, all theories. Possibly that uh, the the snowplow driver possibly would have um, hit the body, but um, he gave evidence. Um, the, the prosecution did try to keep the snowplow driver out of the um, court court trial, but the defence uh, made sure that they got him in as a witness, and he started work around two thirty a.m. in the morning, and. When he came out doing his plowing the snow away, he did not see anyone or anybody lying on the front lawn of um, the O'Keefe's house. And he was actually friendly with the O'Keefe's, he's, so um, he's a good witness to have there. So this is another um, section of the crime facts, or should I say the facts, that um, this was definitely not a murder by Karen Reed. Um, so as I said, it, the snow driver, he came down, he drove past a couple of times, did not see anyone on the front, lying on the front. So this, as I said, this is a, has created a lot of um, mystery <laughs> in this particular case. The third time that he attempted to come down, um, he had to go around a vehicle that was parked in the front and he knows whose car it was. He did mention that it was the, the owner of the home. That's that home you can see behind me, Brian Alberts. And that moves us to what Brian Alberts said, because Brian Alberts said he didn't, he went into to the home, he did not come back out. He parked his car on the left hand side of the, um, or on the right hand side, if, if you're looking at it from the TV screen side, he claims that he parked his car on the right hand side and did not move it for the rest of the, of the night. And obviously there's some sort of untruth there because the snow plow driver, what reason has he got to lie? He told the truth, he said the vehicle was there, he, he, he had to maneuver his vehicle around um, this particular car and this was um, around about probably about 3 30 3 45 a.m in the morning so me my i believe that um, because he he got no skins to rub there together he he's friendly with the O'Keefe's. he's just he's been doing his job for 20 or 30 years he's known him for quite a long time no beef between them so he told the truth so um, this is why a lot of people think that this was um, a not guilty by Karen Reed, because there were so many um, situations by the Boston cops um, of what actually happened. Rather than investigate this as a fallen officer, um, they treated it as less cover for one of our police colleagues um who owns the house because obviously if they had come in and searched the house and if they found a dog and the dog had something to do with this particular um uh, incident that happened at the house obviously this officer would have been sued for millions and um it seems as though they did what they had to do to cover this particular case up this is the way it seems to have went Obviously, some parts of the jury, there were 12 of them, some parts of the jury believed that she was, Karen Reed was guilty, and many others believed that she was not guilty because of the evidence presented. So, um, look as though we're going to have another bite of the cherry, if you call it that. Okay, let's get back to the forcing of the jury, because the jury came out twice to say to the judge that, um, they cannot come to an agreement. They've tried their best, and this started on Friday before the weekend. 
they try their best to um, come to a positive decision, whether guilty or not guilty, but they could not come to a unanimous decision. So they've asked the jury to, um, they asked the judge, um, can they be more or less dismissed and call it a mistrial? But um, the judge refused uh, more or less and sent them back in. So twice the judge sent them back in. Um, you, this is like forcing. <laughs> so basically, the judge was kept them hostage. <laughs> uh, the judge kept them hostage for, um, well, quite a few hours. Uh, almost even bringing them back in in the weekend, and that would have that would have annoyed the jury. But they came back on Monday. Same thing again. Sent them back out. Uh, I think they came in with another question. Then the judge sent them back out to um, deliberate, but they they were still stuck. Um, they were locked tight that they're not going to come to a decision. So, um, going to give you a clip was what would, what the judge read to the jury after they decided. Well, they've had enough and they can't, can't see any way that they're going to. Um, come to a decision. So here's the clip by that. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the like button. Help us to spread right across the um, YouTube network. Okay, here's the um, here's the clip with the judge um, more or less forcing the, the jury to go go back into court and come to a um, final decision. Um, we call it um, being <laughs> being um, held uh, being held. All right, so chairs, I am in receipt of your note, Judge Canoni. Despite our commitment to the duty entrusted to us, we find ourselves deeply divided by fundamental differences in our opinions and state of mind. The divergence in our views are not rooted in a lack of understanding or effort, but deeply held convictions that each of us carry, ultimately leading to a point where consensus is unattainable. We recognize the weight of this admission and the implications it holds. So Mr. Foreman and members of the jury, I have an instruction for you. Our constitution and laws provide that in a criminal case, the principal method for deciding questions of fact is the verdict of a jury. In most cases, and perhaps strictly speaking in all cases, absolute certainty cannot be attained, nor is it expected. The verdict to which each juror agrees must, of course, be his or her own verdict, the result of his or her own convictions, and not merely an acquiescence in the conclusions of the other jurors. Still, in order to bring 12 minds to a unanimous result, you must examine the issues you have to decide with candor and with a proper regard and respect for each other's opinions. You should consider that it is desirable that this case be decided. You have been selected in the same manner and from the same source as any future jury would be selected. There is no reason to suppose that this case will ever be submitted to 12 persons who are more intelligent, more impartial, or more competent to decide it than you are, or that more or clearer evidence will be produced at another trial. With all this in mind, it is your duty to decide this case if you can do so conscientiously. In order to make a decision more attainable, the law always imposes the burden of proof on the Commonwealth to establish every essential element of each indictment beyond a reasonable doubt. If you are left with a reasonable doubt as to any essential element of any indictment, then the defendant is entitled to the benefit of that doubt and must be found not guilty on that indictment. In conferring together, you ought to give proper respect to each other's opinions and listen with an open mind to each other's arguments. Where there is disagreement, those jurors who would find the defendant not guilty should consider whether the doubt in their own minds is a reasonable one. 
if it makes no impression upon the minds of the other jurors who are equally honest and equally intelligent, who have heard the same evidence with the same attention, who have an equal desire to arrive at the truth, and who have taken the same oath as jurors. At the same time, those jurors who would find the defendant guilty ought seriously to ask themselves whether they may not reasonably doubt the correctness of their judgment if it is not shared by other members of the jury. They should ask themselves whether they should distrust the weight or sufficiency of the evidence if it has failed to convince the minds of, of their fellow jurors beyond a reasonable doubt. I will now ask you, Mr. Foreman and members of the jury, to return to your deliberations with these instructions in mind. And as with my final instructions and the supplemental instructions I sent in, I will send in a copy of this charge as well. All right, so may that be marked, Madam Court. There you go. That was the judge um, holding the jury hostage, sending them back out. The prosecution um, did not want the case to finish like that, so they obviously asked the, ju the, um, the judge to send the jurors back out again to deliberate more. Uh, pressure, pressure, pressure. And of course the defense, they were happy to settle at a mistrial because as far as they're concerned, that's a win for them because there's so many, so many holes in this trial. They know if they have to re retry, they are more or less 100% sure that they will win because the um, prosecutor will not want to retry this case. Number one, financially, it's going to be very, very expensive, could, could run into millions. And there is going to be investigation into the um, main prosecutor, of why he pushed this case forward. There'll be investigations why the judge um, let this case go forward despite having evidence from the FBI that um, they're not happy to let the trial go ahead um, with the evidence they gathered from um, the chief investigating officer of this case. Um, yet still, the judge um, denied that because the, the defense did ask for the trial to be thrown out once they got the evidence that um, there was uh, not good things happening <laughs> by the um, detective that was investigating this case. But the, 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 the judge um, decided you now she's going to continue with the trial. And here we are. She's now, um, she, she, not only me, but there have been many other people that are saying this judge is very, 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 and have to say very times 10 bias um, against the defense. So um, that itself to me happened to um, help cause this mistrial and not um, declaring uh, Karen Reed not guilty. Yeah, as a as a basic citizen um, over here in the UK, and looking at this trial, if this was a poor person, <laughs> can see also black person, poor person, brown person, um, without money, there's no way, no way, there would have been. Um, it would have been a mistrial. This would have been a guilty for um, the person um, instead of uh, Karen Reed, because obviously Karen Reed had money. She money was also raised from the uh, community as well as social media. So she's was able to have enough money to fight, um, fight this case and fight the evidence that was um, and the charges that was um, put against her. But um, if you weren't in that position. Uh, you would have had an uphill struggle and you would not have been able to get the defense uh, to fight these um, charges. So um, it's very important that uh, you have the right defense and the only way is money. So if you haven't got money, problems. All I could say is problems. What's helped Karen reading this, and even at the end of the day, it, 
turned out to be a mistrial, but what's helped her is the funds she's had to fight this case. So um, that's why two things. If you ever get um, caught up with the police and uh, anything that has happened, make sure you have yourself a lawyer and try to get the best lawyer at the end of the day in any which way you can. Because um, from what from what we've seen in this case, um, not all police are honest. There is many good police, of course, and law officers. Talking about the um, the prosecution and the prosecutor who put this case forward, they've had evidence, not the right evidence, but they just wanted this case to go forward to make a point. Almost send, almost sending a more or less an innocent person to to jail for life. She would have possibly got up to probably fifty years if she was found guilty on this. As I said, lucky she's got money. She's had her own money. She's a very intelligent person, good jobs, whatever. So she was able to fight this case, and even as I said, even fighting this case, it's been an uphill struggle. She's had the judge not on her side she said the all the police officers not on her side and as i said the judge has kept a lot of evidence away from the jury very confusing case very upsetting case and um rest in peace john o'keefe and from what we can see as from today what happened with this mistrial it looks as though there's not going to be any justice for uh, John O'Keefe, he's the one at the bottom left in the uniform there, the Boston uh, police officer. We can only guess what happened to him um, on that early morning of 29th of January. We're not sure 100% whether he was um, killed in that house, the house behind me, or whether um, he was run over at the front of the house by his girlfriend. We would never know the truth on this one because too much evidence was kept away um as i said we might know more from the fbi as the mums come forward because there's um investigations going on with many of the um uh, police officers especially the two police officers that um uh deleted their phones or threw their phones away in dumpsters or crap the sim card um so we couldn't get more uh, data from them so that's a big problem but they're under investigations and hopefully the truth will come out you know it's um these type of cases if someone's going to lose their privileges in life you know everything need to be on the table the the prosecution need to put everything on the table to so that the defense can um defend their client and this did not happen in this particular case and worst of all is the forcing of the jury to stay in even after they came and said we cannot come to a decision that's a problem this is definitely a case that um everyone should follow up um I do have another, I think it's five or six other videos of the Karen Reed um, trial as it started from the beginning, but it's definitely a trial that you should follow and um, understand as much as you can because once you get um, tainted evidence from police, it throws everything into dispute. And this is a typical case of um, exactly what happened. Um, over the next few months, we'll be watching what actually happens to um, this uh, police family that um, told all the untruths. And the evidence will come out. Um, I'm not sure we're going to find out exactly what happened to this officer, um, John O'Keefe. But for these witnesses, like um, Jennifer McCarb, um, Brian Albert, um, Michael Proctor, Chief Butewick, or Budewick, I'm not sure exactly how to uh, pronounce his name. Um, the cop, his name, um, another one named Tully, and of course, Conan Albert, he's the son of um, 
Brian Albert, there's uh, two or three others. There is only one police officer that absolutely told the truth. As I said, he said when he arrived and to take note, he um, spotted a crack um, lamp at the back of the car. And that was true. The only time that that um, car shattered in pieces was when it was received back at the Canton um, garage, uh, police station, I should say. And this is where the crack pieces all came from. So um, over the next few months, we'll definitely be looking at the bits and pieces of evidence that's going to come out um, to exonerate um, Karen Reed. This this should definitely not be of mistrial. It should be not guilty. You know, um, there is so many inconsistencies in this case and all confused between the police and not enough evidence uh, being um, uh, let in by the by the judge. Not sure if she if she's um, in favour with the um, the prosecution office there, which she shouldn't be. She should be independent. But during the trial, the amount of objections she made against the um, defence was unbelievable. Um, I have to applaud Alan Jackson and Mr. Yanetti, the defence lawyers for Karen Reid. They were absolutely cool, despite being annoyed with the judge at many times. They kept very cool, and because it possibly would have made things worse. Definitely, we can call this the trial. Definitely, call this the trial of the century. Right. So, as I said, this is a trial that was um, unreasonable doubt. We can say the evidence was so overwhelming by the uh, defense, as with the experts, because the experts actually said um, some of the accident reconstruction um, officers, they said um, this this accident was not consistent with a car collision with a person. And um, yet still, it's been classed as a mistrial. It's not, I'm not guilty. I just hope that uh, Karen Reed don't have to go through all of this again. Also, it was um, it was also noted that Karen Reed, when she reached home at twelve thirty six a.m., right through to approximately four o'clock in the morning, she was she was actually calling John O'Keefe nonstop at least fifty three times. Um, some of you might think that um, the reason she was calling fifty three times because she knew she did something to him. But if you listen to the phone calls, and I think I've got that in some of my earlier videos, you would see that um, it was like phone calls of a kind of jealousy, like to, where are you, where are you, John? Uh, she kind of felt that maybe she's he's with um, another woman at the party, um, or got caught up with another woman at the other party. So the 53 phone calls, um, that part of the morning was definitely not um, not after the fact of um, killing him, as I should say. The most the most damaging evidence in this, um, and I think the def defense did a good job on this. They had one of the best um, experts in data, phone data knowledge, was that. Um, uh, Karen Reed did not make a call at 2.30 a.m. in the morning asking how long would it take for a body to freeze in this um, cold weather. It seems as though Jennifer Macau made this call at 2.30 a.m. Why would you be calling at 2.30 a.m. on a, or not calling, why would you be searching on Google? to um, ask him how long does it take a, a body to freeze 
in the in the cold the only reason you're going to do that is if you know something or whether or whether you were involved in um connection with who caused the death of john o'keith obviously um she denied jennifer mccarb denies uh, making that phone call but the data the data evidence proved from the defense that um that call was 100 percent made at 2 30 a.m and the prosecution said no that call was made at 6 30. they they did have one of their witnesses in to say that no um something happened around 2 30 but um it did not continue it actually happened at 6 30 a.m in the morning not conclusive but i think the defense was very conclusive that that call made at 2 30 so this is part of the reason that the um was a mistrial because the jury is totally totally confused but as i said justice will come i do have um some comments made across the social media network i'm gonna read a few comments from um different areas um so you can see how the public was uh, thinking in this country and obviously abroad um as you know this case become very became very international from australia all over the world uk europe um down there in south africa so i'm going to give you some of the comments okay don't forget to um smash that um subscribe button and um leave all your comments let me know which way you're thinking on this um particular case okay um as i said i'm gonna give you some of the comments um this one by heather s i was really hoping for a not guilty verdict but i suppose at least the hung trial is a better than a guilty verdict also um tj says uh paul o'keefe was probably ice by those other cops and uh, another comment by Cynthia Harvey. Cynthia Harvey, hope the FBI can prove to everyone KR did not kill John. That's Karen Reed, of course. Um, just uh, there you go. Some of some of the comments that's going across um, on this um, particular trial. So let's see what other comments comments are there. Let's see. Um, okay. So you say john martin as long as they keep the camera off um john o'keefe's mother i could watch again basically because john o'keefe's uh, mother she kept on crying in the court because obviously i think she's realized that um she's never going to get justice with um how the case has gone uh too many untruths lots of things kept back from the jury and it's going to be very difficult for um to get justice for her son so she was in tears uh most of the time uh we got another comment here by um amy M amy nalia says how many moderators are they reminding us to click the like button ah not sure what that meant okay jerry smith there's still a federal investigation hanging over this case that plays out before any retrial by before the state and that's absolutely true there is um definitely the fbi investigation that's going on and the jury was not aware of this this was not um coming to evidence by the judge the judge obviously kept that away from the jury um she possibly felt that that this was going to be prejudiced the case but to me everything should come in because the reason why the FBI came into this is to um they felt the evidence that they gathered was beneficial uh for the case because they felt that Karen Reed was not uh guilty of what she was charged for so they handed evidence into the court hoping that the court would have um looked at the thousands and thousands of pages of evidence and put a hold to the case even before it before it came to this stage and obviously that did not happen the judge 
did not want that to happen. So um, that definitely did not come in. But as I said, um, hopefully, hopefully, the more evidence will come in uh, from the from the FBI. Right. Um, we got VTS. VTS says um, scratches are covering an area of 12, 12 inches to half an inch across. This is the scratches from the on the John O'Keefe's arm. Um, they said the tail light broken is only six inches across. So how how were they able to have twelve inches of scratches across the arm um, and only six inches across of the tail light? If because they're saying that the tail light is what caused the scratches, and to most people's eyes, the tail light it look um, the tail light could not have done that damage. There's many reasons why the tail light could not have done, done that damage because had his had he put his arm out to block the vehicle coming towards him, and according to the prosecution, those um, those scratches got there because of the tail light. What about the weight of the vehicle? Even because they're saying it at 22 miles an hour, she was reversing. So um, the medical uh, examiners said that the force, the force of the vehicle would have possibly broken his arm, even broken uh, internal injuries on his chest side, and he did not and had any injuries below from his um, chest downwards, on his feet. There was no no injuries, so that obviously in dispute there. Um, um, why is it a mistrial? It should have been definitely not guilty. Um, other says uh, someone is saying Sandra Moran, I'm ready for this. I think Lally is bluffing about retrying her. Yeah, what Lally, who is the uh, prosecution uh, lawyer, um, he said at the end of the case, we are definitely going to retry the case. Um, most people don't think this is going to happen. Um, uh, she's saying, Sandra Moran is saying, what real witnesses does he have? Which he hasn't. He, he didn't really have any witness. So, okay, yes, he had a uh, Jennifer McCabe saying that she said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. And that was also said by one of the first responders who knew who knew the Alberts and their family, which is Alberts, obviously, the police family. They were uh, school friends together. They go out together, they go drinking together, and so forth. So um, they could have been uh, colluding all together to put evidence against Karen Reed. So definitely, it's going to be very difficult for the prosecution to retry this. There's too many uh, inconsistencies that will come up to block the case. And of course, it's going to be an expensive, expensive um, case to retry again with all 72 witnesses. And I'm sure these police officers will not want to give evidence again. So I can't see it being retried. Obviously, Karen Reed will not be happy till her name is completely clear. So it might never get clear. People would look at her and think, did she do it? And others would think, no, she didn't. Others would think, yes, she did it. Okay, um, Holly, I do hope we get to hear where the jurors were um, at in terms of numbers. Yes, what that is, um, we're not sure whether it was 50-50 um, for guilty or 50-50 not guilty or how the numbers were, was it 10 to 2 or was it 8 to 4? But I'm sure we'll find out eventually. Um, many of these viewers, many a times they go on to television or radio, radio shows um, to the media to explain their side of how it goes. So we do expect to hear that within the next few days or so. And it says, Kim House, Kim uh, House, she says, my friends uh, think that the Macalbrus have so much power. And I think what she means by that is that um, they somehow had had influence 
over the witnesses who gave evidence being police officers. Um, it's possible, very, very, very possible. And uh, Sarah A says um, it should be moved, the trial should be moved. If they're going to have a retrial, it should be moved to another area, um, an area that can be more impartial and away from all these uh, police officers. I'm going to say, well, the case was so publicized, um, as I said, it became very international, so uh, I doubt if they're going to find impartial um, impartial witnesses or not witnesses, impartial jurors to this particular case who hasn't heard about the case. Um, uh, Lurie says, it's crazy outside the courthouse. The smirk on Karen is so dis disrespectful to the O'Keefe's. Well, um, if I've caught up in a case like this myself and they, it came up to me that um, I didn't have to go to jail and it's been a retrial. Yes, I'm going to have a smile on my face. That smile is for me not having my liberties taken away. Um, the smile doesn't mean that she killed her boyfriend, her cop boyfriend, and she's got away with it. So, um, but that's your opinion. Okay, have we got any more? Have we got any more? Um, uh, um, any chat, any more chat on this uh, particular case? Uh, so they say they are going to retry because cops was killed, otherwise they probably wouldn't. I hope the FBI investigation stops them. Yeah, that, that's been repeated quite a lot about the FBI investigation, which obviously, as I said earlier, the F FBI sent in their the thousands of um, pages of uh, investigation uh, documents to the to the um, to the courthouse and to the judge, but she decided to keep it out, keep a lot of the information out. So um, let's hope they do come in and step in again before the next trial and bring some more evidence, which would free. Karen Reed, totally. Okay, Penny, Penny, for your thoughts. This is uh, her, her um, coming. I can't believe anyone could sit through that trial and not see reasonable doubt. Absolutely, absolutely true. I do believe in that. Absolutely reasonable doubt all the way. There is so many stages of reasonable doubt, you know, especially. Um, the evidence given by most of these police officers who was uh, investigating the case. So um, um, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Uh, big shout to those over there in um, Barbados. Hi, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Crime Vlog Weekly, each and every time. Don't forget to spread the word to your friends and family. And hit that um, like button and, of course, the subscribe button. Okay, guys, I hope you have um, enjoyed the coverage of this uh, Karen Reed uh, trial, or should I say mistrial. Um, I have got another five videos within the, my library, if you check it out, which would also help to bring you up to date of um, everything that's happened from day one right through to day 35, I think it is, of this uh, trial. Um, as I think they, they are coming back to court sometime either the 24th or the 25th of July, we'll update you on what is said in court um, at that time. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I'm gonna ask you guys to hit that subscribe button. Um, make sure that you keep up to date with all my videos and as i said all the other trials trials that's going on we do have um well over 400 and probably 450 videos in our library um please share some of these videos and of course hit that like button we are hoping to get up there to around 50,000 subscribers 
as soon as possible. Um, and I'm going to say a big shout out to those new subscribers over there in uh, Kenya and those down there in Barbados and those over there in Canada. Thank you very much. Um, nice to have you guys with us. And um, well, that's it from me, uh, Citizen Hartley. As I said, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a basic citizen like you guys looking into um, the trials and the criminal activity, police activity that's going on around the world, mainly focusing on uh, North America, Canada, within the 50 states, or is it 51 states of America? And at the same time, learning American law. I have learned quite a lot. I'm not sure you've heard of Melanie Little. Just um, put that into your search search box on um, YouTube. And very informative attorney. She was a prosecution attorney, defense attorney. And she's now retired, but uh, she has got a fantastic channel. I've been watching her channel quite a lot and learning um, a lot of the law and um, what goes on over there in the criminal cases in America. So I'm going to say thank you very much, and I will see you guys again shortly. Thank you. Bye-bye.